Mary Bowman, uh, who is a partner at, at uh, Gustafson Porter and Bowman, um, is going to talk to us this afternoon about her career path. Um, <clears throat> Mary is responsible for the design direction and day-to-day -day management of Gustafson Porter and Bowman, together with Neil Porter. She is currently leading a multidisciplinary design team for the Eiffel Tower project in preparation for the 2024 Paris Olympics. Additionally, she is working at International uh, working at International Quarter London, Sifluci in Doha, uh, One Taiko Place in Hong Kong, and Europea Wio in Brussels. Uh, she has also worked on high-profile projects, including the Princess Diana Memorial Fountain in London, Valencia Park Central in Spain, Marina One in Singapore, and many more. Her particular interest in integration of landscape and architecture and the vital role landscape architecture can play in meeting today's global challenges. Uh, Mary studied architecture at the University of Virginia and at the Architectural Association in London, graduating in 1988. She worked for Foster and Partners for over a decade, where she was one of the first female associates and led the design teams for the Bilbao Metro and the Duisburg Microelectronics Center and several sustainable master plans. And I should also say, Mary and I were classmates at the A. And I was looking actually, Mary, for the see if I could find a picture Long of the, uh, the, the <laughs> bridge that we did together. But uh, oh, I've got it. Don't uh, worry. I can find one easily. So anyway, uh, Mary and I have known each other for for many years, and I'm delighted, Mary, that you are able to join us today um, and talk about your 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 passions, your career, and your your work. So I'll hand it over to you. Okay. And. Uh, and we can and Mary's agreed to ask uh, uh, to, to uh, entertain questions at the end too. So if you have questions, uh, don't feel free to to hold those until the end of the talk. Okay. Sorry, so I'm thanks, Mary. Jumping ahead of myself here. Thank you very much, John. Um, I um, I'll talk a little bit about my uh, sort of career uh, Mary, education you, career you. path, hmm? and um, and then I'll I'll show you a few projects that uh, that we've been working on. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? John? Still no sound. Can you hear me? Uh, I, I can hear you, Mary. OK. Fine before. Yeah, um, John, um, John, I could hear you fine before also. I, I don't know if you did something or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still nothing. Oh, yeah. well, uh, shall I just assume it's on John's yeah. side and carry on? <laughs> oh dear. I think so, we're fine. OK, so I just wanted to explain, I suppose, Gibbs, you're all embarking on your uh, careers, but I think um, one of the influences uh, for me was Frank Lloyd Wright's um, Falling Water. I mean, I grew up in in Pittsburgh and I think this building and just the whole environment was um, was sort of the reason why I wanted to study architecture. And I decided quite early on. Uh, when I was, you know, a young teen, that that's what I wanted to um, study. And then um, later on in, in my life, I ended up moving uh, sideways into hang on a landscape. Second. I don't know if you can, can you hear me. You do. <laughs> I think an, another um, important um, a aspect to consider also is the the sort of culture that you're from. My mother is Mexican, and I think I'm I've been quite. Um, influenced by by that culture and also uh, by a kind of landscape that's maybe very different from North American or or European one, um, and I see those influences coming coming back sometimes in the work. I studied at the University of Virginia um, in the uh, architecture uh, school there, and I think as well as you know doing the four year course, I, the the whole campus that was designed by. Um, Thomas Jefferson was also an inspiration for me, the way that um, the landscape and buildings are integrated into this academic village. And during that time, I spent time um, in Venice um, as part of a, you know, a semester abroad program there, where one of the professors, Mario um, Valmarana, his family owns the Villa Rotonda. And again, that influence of these um, Palladian uh, villas as they sit in the landscape um, was quite important. And I think I was always drawn uh, to these projects, um, a kind of architecture that sat uh, within a wider landscape context. I then, from Virginia, I went to the Architectural um, Association, which, which is where I met uh, John. And I think as well as the formal um, education, 
which a lot of it was uh, sort of autodidactic, you know, t- teaching yourself and learning through your own uh, design work. Um, but there were also opportunities for doing things out, outside of that normal uh, coursework, like this bridge that we built together with John and, and uh, three others, which was um, a structure that was welded together in the workshop there and then hoisted up and spanned across a, um, a courtyard. And it's something that you never would be allowed to do now. I mean, health and safety wise, it was just completely crazy. And there were no structural calculations or, or anything. It was just a kind of, you know, really welded together in, in, in the workshop and then uh, put up. And I think that those experiences were also um, really important. I'm also interested in photography and um, enjoy taking uh, photographs. And I think, again, that sort of, um, compressed, almost flattened notion of space that you get in countries like Mexico or in the Mediterranean where the light is very bright is something that has um, always interested me. And of course, history through uh, painting. When I first um, came to the AA, this was one of the first, we did, we did a sort of analysis of a historical painting as a starting point for a project we were doing with um, Don Bates and Raoul Bunchotten and this kind of this idea of of movement through um, a landscape and a, and a very flattened landscape then became the starting point for a piece of animation, um, sort of uh, cartoon animation, hand drawn animation that I uh, worked on in my first year. And I think it's also important when you're a, a student to begin to position yourself um, politically and culturally and and know you know have a view. Um, about how you know how you feel about uh, politics and um, things like that. This was a project that um, I did in the final year, which was about St. Paul's. It was meant to be, um, you know, it's a huge development site, and a lot of the developers at the time were proposing kind of maximum density. And this was a sort of provocative piece that, that was talking about a minimum density uh, project. Um, and I started working a lot. I mean, quite a lot of projects that I was doing at the time for whatever reason were underground projects, working with uh, work, working with the ground and exploring the underground. Um, this was part of that same project in uh, St. Paul's where I was looking at the connection from, from the tube line up to, uh, up to the ground level. And then that sort of led on in a funny way to working at, um, at Foster's. And I was, I was, um, employed in 1988, I guess, to work on uh, the Bilbao Metro. And one of the reasons I think I was asked to work on the project is I spoke Spanish um, and I did, uh, I was able to do all the uh, communication with the client um, when I was, you know, quite inexperienced just out of, uh, just out of school. Um, and also because I, ha- I had this kind of personal fascination with working, um, working underground. Um, and we, you can see, we, we designed um, a whole uh, line, um, actually two lines um, that ran from Bilbao out to the coast, connecting the, the suburbs with the, with the downtown. And it was the first uh, real um, you know, public transport system in Bilbao. And it was fascinating at the time working in the city. It reminded me a lot of Pittsburgh. It's a steel city that was undergoing this kind of radical transformation from an industrial town to um, more service industries, um, you know, biotech and and that kind of thing. And also with the Bilbao, uh, with the Guggenheim Museum, also um, bringing uh, cultural activities into the heart of the town, which were previous dockyards and that kind of thing. So a lot of the detailing in in um, in the metro was made possible by um, you know, this kind of steel industry, uh, the technology that they'd already already developed for their blast furnaces and that kind of thing, which allowed us to design these stainless steel mezzanines without any fire protection. And then I think working in, in the public realm um, and on a kind of urban scale project um, sort of increased my, my interest in, in working, particularly in the public realm, rather than uh, in you know for private clients and also working in in landscape um, at that time and then in between uh, Foster's which were which where I worked for about 10 years 
I worked with a friend of mine who had also been at, at Foster's, Cindy Walters, who started a practice called Walters and Cohen um, and have built up their practice around um, largely around schools, starting with sort of nursery schools and then uh, working, working their way up and now working on, you know, many uh, university campuses. But I, I like this quite intimate level of, you know, in, um, intricate detail and, uh, you know, the sort of, the, this was a spa, um, you know, uh, it was very physical um, about the body um, and very, and quite sensual. So I, I kind of, I like those two scales between the very large scale urban scale and this very intimate detail um, scale. And when um, I was with, I stayed with Walters and Cohen for about three years. And then um, I was approached by Neil Porter to join um, Gustafson Porter. And I didn't know, I mean, honestly, I hadn't been trained in landscape. I, I only had an, an interest in landscape. And I, I said to Neil, I said, look, I know nothing about plants. I don't know that much about landscape. Um, and Neil is also trained at the AA as an architect. And he, he, he sort of encouraged me, said, ah, you know, don't worry, you'll learn. It's, you know, um, and that, for me, it was, a, it was a kind of huge learning curve um, and kind of a fascinating one because every, every project is obviously different. Um, it's not to say that every architectural project isn't different, but you're, you're dealing with, you know, the environmental, cultural, political, um, you know, there's so many different factors that make each one of the projects um, unique. And that's something that I've really appreciated working in the landscape. Um, and th this was the first project that I, um, when I joined the practice, um, was working on. Neil and Catherine had won the competition before I uh, joined. Um, and it was really a, um, an interesting project to try and deliver this memorial in the time that we had available and with this sort of um, ambition. And the way that it was sort of, it was achieved was through um, using di digital technology for stone masonry, with, which at the time um, was quite um, innovative. Um, landscape as, as cultural expression is something that, um, that interests me. So how, how are you sort of, um, how are you expressing the values of a culture, but also the values of um, individuals. In this case, obviously, it's a, a memorial to Princess Diana. It was meant to evoke certain qualities about her, but they're also universal uh, qualities. And those were um, expressed through a series of, um, of water features um, that were, were created either by modeling the stone um, or by uh, mechanical means. Sometimes water was entrained in, into the water feature to create bubbles or to create different different effects. But as you walk around it, it's a very kind of uh, central experience because uh, um, what you can't see from any of the images is, is that the sound changes as you, as you walk around. And sometimes it's very calm, sometimes it's very active, sometimes it's agitated. Um, the piece on the left-hand side is called the Chadar. Um, which is a traditional, you know, sort of Indian uh, water uh, water feature uh, typology for, um, you know, uh, dealing with level change, but also creating the sort of white water effect. The one in the middle is called uh, is a is a stream referred to her love of nature and um, and the outdoors. And the one on the right is called the rock and roll and referred to her um, uh, kind of, uh, you know, interest in, in partying and dancing and, and that kind of thing. And then it goes into a very calm, reflecting uh, pool. And the whole thing is a, is a, a circular, um, circular form. Um, another project I wanted to show you was the Parque Central in Valencia. Um, this is a project that's on top of uh, an existing railway land and um, this first phase has been delivered at the end of, uh, of 2018. It's a 20, overall a, a 23 um, hectare park and this area is about, I think it's about um, half of that in, in area, maybe a bit less than half. And uh, when we first um, started looking at this project, which was a competition, um, we obviously studied all of the landscape 
landscape types around uh, the city of Valencia, including the mountains, the rivers, the freshwater lagoon, where a lot of the rice is uh, grown, and the Mediterranean Sea. And water is obviously a very important element um, uh, in Valencia. You can see here the context. Um, the site is, um, an, uh, is a railway land. The intention was to bring a high-speed um, rail line um, uh, station underground, uh, which would then free up all this area. The tracks would go away and would free up this entire central area for, um, for the park. And in the, in the um, railway lands at the moment are a lot of these uh, existing workshop buildings, uh, uh, storage buildings, and a lot of those, the red ones that you can see in the middle here, were di completely dismantled and moved to the edges of the site to um, activate the site and become, uh, you know, different elements, uh, buildings uh, within the park. The concept was uh, des designed around this notion of a bowl. Um, the Valencia is uh, known for its ceramics. Um, it's also very rich, very abundant in, in uh, fruit and vegetables and uh, sea life and that kind of thing. So that there, there was this notion of sort of offering and, and abundance. Um, and in this image, you can see um, how uh, that bowl-like uh, shape found its imprint in the, in the landscape. This is a model on the left-hand side that Catherine uh, worked on. And we um, quite often work in clay. And then those, the clay models are cast into um, uh, plaster a rubber mold is taken of the plaster and uh, um, sorry, the, the, the clay has a rubber mold on it and then we can create a, a plaster cast using that uh, rubber mold. And then the plaster casts are scanned so that we can bring that into a digital format and then uh, create models, um, you know, CNC cut models such as the one on the uh, right hand side. So there's a whole kind of process from hand to uh, digital that often um, it gets developed in our projects. This is a, a plan of the overall site showing um, all the various uh, uh, spaces. It's um, orientated along a, a north-south uh, north spine with sort of major plazas at either end of that uh, spine. And then um, clustered around the, um, the buildings are various water features, which you can see here in blue. Each, each entrance um, to the adjacent neighborhood usually uh, announces itself with a small plaza and a water feature that then draws you into the center of the, of the space and sort of holds you in the center and then allows you to move um, out. So it was really about reconnecting these um, uh, different neighborhoods that have been cut off from uh, the railway lands. In this uh, first phase of the project, um, you can see the, some of the um, existing uh, railway buildings have been um, restored with a large uh, water feature in front of it. Um, um, the, the area in pink is a floral garden. The, the mayor of Valencia, who uh, started off this project and competition, loved flowers, loved bright colors, and um, that was a, a garden really uh, designed for her. Um, this area where it says one is the Huerta garden, and that's a kind of demonstration garden um, and a uh, vegetable and fruit garden and herb garden that is reminiscent of the Huerta garden that surrounds the whole of Valencia. And then uh, the middle, this middle piece with the long uh, canal is um, called the Romantic garden. There are a lot of uh, canals and water channels that help to irrigate uh, the fields um, around Valencia. So again, it was a reference uh, to that. And then a, um, a children's garden uh, to the south with its, um, the, there's a slide and there's a play equipment. And along this edge there and this edge, there are two large uh, retaining walls that form, help to form these bowls so that there's a level change of about six meters. Um, and, uh, and, you know, a lot of uh, three-dimensional movement, whereas obviously the railway um, lands were quite uh, flat. So these are some of the images of the um, those railway buildings that have been restored. We worked, I mean, we worked obviously in collaboration with architects and engineers, project managers in Spain. We formed a, a joint venture with them. Um, 
and uh, some of the features. Um, so this this large feature can be used. It's a, it's a water feature. Pe people can uh, play in it, but it can also be drained down and used as a, a, a large um, events uh, plaza. And another one of the um, the basins, as you walk first walk into the site from the Rusafa neighborhood, um, there's this uh, large reflecting pool, again, with the restored uh, buildings behind it. And another water channel, which in a way is supposed to be evocative of a, of a river or, or a stream, uh, which has been uh, created from the stonework. And um, again, we work in, in Rhino uh, to model the, the uh, topography. And then um, these channels, which are evocative of the irrigation channels that would have been um, irrigating the, the fields in, uh, around, around Valencia. And um, the trees, there's a very rich um, palette of trees, which, which again, evoke all of those um, uh, different um, uh, areas, such as the mountains, the, um, the Mediterranean, and so on. So each, each bowl, if you will, has its own uh, very distinct uh, landscape character. And obviously a, a very distinct uh, palette as you move um, between one, one space and the other. This is an image of that, um, the uh, Huerta garden with its olive trees and, um, you know, ed edible uh, plants and herbs. Um, and it's a place for, you know, the, that um, school children can come and uh, learn about the, uh, the produce that has been um, grown historically in Valencia. It's also a very pleasant place to sit and um and watch uh, and relax um, on these uh, seating terraces. And this is um, an image of one of the buildings, one of those sheds that has been renovated. And it, the intention is that um, there will be, um, you know, a number of uh, uh, restaurants and, you know, opportunities for food and beverage and, and that kind of thing. One of the um, uh, elements that we enjoyed uh, designing is this uh, green wall. So those um, almost six meter high uh, walls have a, a concrete re retaining wall uh, behind them. But then in front of them, there are these precast elements um, that were designed to be um, uh, planters. And then, I mean, here you can see, um, and now when you go there, it, the entire wall is almost uh, completely covered with, uh, with planting. And I think the important thing about um, this project is it's really a place for people. And it's been great uh, to see that, um, you know, people of all age groups have uh, found a place within uh, within the, the park and it's very well loved um, by, uh, by people in Valencia and especially has helped to, to completely activate some of those um, neighborhoods around it that have been uh, cut off. Um, another project I wanted to talk to you about was a project in Stratford that's, um, that's ongoing. Um, it's in, near the Olympic Park, this large, uh, this, is, this is a painting that was done for um, for a charity um, that I contribute to called 10 by 10. And the charity um, auctions artwork or photographs or um, you know, other uh, pieces of art every year, produced mostly by architects, but then the, the money goes to help um, you know, countries in, uh, in disaster zones and that kind of thing to rebuild. Um, but this, uh, the, the larger one is the Olympic Stadium and the, um, uh, the Aquatic Center and, and the Velodrome. And our site is um, adjacent to uh, the Olympic site, which is sort of on the bottom of the, of the page. And, and the, you know, there's sort of large Westfield uh, shopping center. And then um, in between those two is, is um, a new culture and education uh, quarter that's uh, currently being um, built. But we've been working on the on the master plan for a number of years, and it's slowly being um, built out. It's um, it's being designed uh, for lend lease, and uh, Rogers were the initial um, Richard Rogers uh, Rogers Stark Harbor now um, are, are the architects. But here you can see the context with the um, with the orbital and the um, the stadium in the background, 
um, we're hard up against the um, the railway line here, and the ambition w really was to try and green uh, this area of the site um, as much as as possible. This is um, the first uh, phase of um, of the master plan around a, a building that is now being occupied by the British Council, and the ground floor of it is a um, a gallery space. Um, and again, I think one of the aspects that uh, we quite enjoy is working with other um, other artists. Um, this was a shelter that was done by, um, uh, you know, by a young practice, which if you look at it, is actually the form of a house sort of tilted on its side. And it's, it's meant to be an outdoor amph amphitheater or outdoor uh, working um, station that then looks towards the art gallery um, inside the S9 building. And uh, another view of this is um, uh, an orchard uh, garden, and you can see the lighting is sort of reminiscent of the cat catenary system of the railway. And this pathway will lead to a, a bridge that then crosses the railway into the culture and education quarter and then into the Olympic Park. And um, this, these are just some uh, images of the uh, project um, uh, on site at the moment. So this is a building that's uh, built by, um, designed by the architects ACME. And uh, they are, um, well, you know, we've been collaborating uh, with them. The building will be a, a restaurant building, restaurant cafe with a roof level terrace and the sort of amphitheater that looks towards a, a water feature, which are these sort of teardrop shapes that you can see in the uh, foreground of the image. And this is uh, an, an image of another um, art piece that's being done by um, a young firm called Troika. Um, it's actually a two-dimensional piece. It's a, a kind of trompe l'oeil. Um, looks like it's it's raised, but um, and they they call it uh, the maze. And then um, I wanted to show you finally the um, the Eiffel Tower project, which is the project that's being. Uh, that we've been working on for the last couple of years. Again, it was won in um, international competition, um, and we are currently going through uh, the planning uh, process, and we've just completed the tender documentation for the project, awaiting the outcome of the uh, the planning. It's um, it's a huge site. It's uh, it spans from one uh, one side of the river uh, to the other. And it's also located in this incredibly historic context of uh, listed um, landscapes along the Seine in Paris. Um, you, uh, a lot of you probably know that the, the, the tower was built for um, the International Exposition at the end of the 19th uh, century. And the site has always been occupied as an exhibition site and it's always spanned the two sides of the river. Um, across the Seine into the, the, the Varsovy Gardens and the Chaillot um, Palace. So the, the concept really was about reunifying these two sides of the site into one unique uh, landscape. So we called the project one, which is obviously um, a, a number, but was it was also, also spoke about this ambition to unify the whole site and have, have a sort of singular vocabulary and a singular uh, approach to uh, across the site, and in, in our analysis of, of the um, of the site, it, uh, the problem at the moment is that the Eiffel Tower attracts all of the attention. Um, it gets uh, eight million visitors a, um, a year, and the entire site is completely, um, you know, compacted. It hasn't been looked after very well, um, and it's it's um, quite degraded. So part of the idea was to distribute uh, uh, more activities and more points of interest across the site. So people, um, either tourists or residents, can, can appreciate the whole garden again, not just for the singularity of the Eiffel Tower, but for many other events and activities that can take place uh, within that site, while at the same time maintaining this, this sort of monumentality of this um, line that goes from uh, from the uh, military school to the Shio Palace. And then reinforcing the whole um, ecology of the site by increasing the amount of green space and then overlaying that with a, a cultural um, offer 
so that as people go through, there will be uh, signage and panels and digital information that tell people about the, the history of the site. There are three um, listed monuments, the, 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 the Shayo Palace, the, um, uh, the Eiffel Tower, and the um, military school down at the bottom, and the uh, Pont Diana, the, the um, Diana Bridge is also a listed monument. There's a very strong presence of, of water with several water features along that main axis. And there are several um, plazas that are, you know, uh, located. And part of the um, strategy for the project is to um, have places, hard surfaces, where events can take place so that we can protect um, the landscape, uh, protect the lawns and protect the planting from this huge crowds um, that attend the site. There are two types of, of landscape, um, which is quite interesting across the site. There's this very formal um, axis, this two kilometer long axis with this great, um, you know, green carpet, these lawn panels uh, in the Chon Mars. And then there's a there's the picturesque landscape, which um, which frames that central axis, which really dates from the end of the 19th century, at the same time that the Eiffel Tower uh, was being built. Um, we, as part of the competition, we looked at the overall vision, so how how one might complete uh, the entire site with a strong central axis and the restoration of the gardens around it, um, and before the Olympics, we're going to um, uh, build the first phase of it, which involves the pieces around that central axis. And then hopefully in the phase two, the rest of the Chon Mars and the other gardens will be, um, will be uh, redone. So you can see in, in here, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through it. There's, this is the Place de Trocadero, which at the moment is a, a roundabout the fountain of Varsovie and the terraces around it, the greening of the bridge, uh, the area underneath the Eiffel Tower. We're creating a new uh, planted promenade that leads people to a metro station here. So as, as soon as you come out of the station, you feel like you're in the Eiffel Tower um, site. There's a building here that we're renovating and the um, the gardens uh, to the south, to well, the northernmost uh, section of the Chon Mars, and then a little piece down at the bottom uh, that links to the Ecole Militaire. Um, uh, metro station. And one of the big, um, you know, elements of the project is try to try and pedestrianize the site as much as possible to eliminate cars from uh, the central um, axis and divert them to um, to other bridges. And um, the it also involved the uh, redirection of the city bus. Um, uh, bus routes. So we've worked, had to work a lot with uh, the RATP and the um, SNCF and so on to uh, redirect those buses so so that they can um, uh, they can access the um, the Eiffel Tower site. But cars, um, private vehicles, will be restricted from uh, from the bridge itself. So this is the. Um, uh, the uh, Trocadero, which today is a is a, a, a round, you know, a roundabout, and um, so we we're proposing to have a a, a terraced uh, lawn area where you can have uh, small gatherings of, of people, but you also get this fantastic view uh, on axis with uh, the Eiffel Tower. When people come out of the metro on either side, they will then be safe from cars and be able to move through and get this kind of fantastic um, view of the tower. You know, it's this kind of selfie point on that, uh, the parvis, the Loire de l'Homme, between the, the two wings of the um, Chaillot uh, Palace. Um, as part of the project, we're actually moving this uh, a statue. This is a Maréchal Foch, and we're, <laughs> we're moving him back a, a few meters so that, um, so that he, he will be in the prominent point at the top of that uh, <clears throat> the natural hill. And there's a, as you can imagine, a lot of complexity we're building over the top of metro tunnels and uh, a million services and, you know, uh, below ground, underground things. You can imagine working in a, in a city um, as old as Paris, the things that you find uh, in the ground. So huge amount of uh, coordination that, that's being done to, um, uh, to create the, um, the overall park. 
just a, um, a, a little image. So the idea is that, that um, the hard areas can be used for staging and, and for events and the soft areas really are kept for, uh, for people. This is a view of the, um, the Varsavi uh, terraces. Um, which uh, today are, um, again, very degraded. The, the grass is completely worn. Um, and the proposal is to create these stone um, edges so that people can have uh, can sit on these edges when there are in, events in, inside of the fountain. So they, they either drain down the fountain or they, they put a, a stage across uh, the fountain and they have everything from fashion shows to you know, ice skating to um, various uh, events. So um, here you can see that uh, um, the central fountain. And another important aspect of the, of the project was the pedestrianization of this um, area of, um, of Varsavi, which is uh, today it's, a, it's um, you know, completely given over to cars and tomorrow will be completely pedestrianized. And then the, um, the bridge, which has, uh, you know, thousands of people going over it. At the moment, it's a, you know, eight lane, eight lane bridge. And uh, tomorrow will be uh, fully pedestrianized with the um, ability to, uh, you know, for buses and security vehicles and that kind of thing uh, to cross over. So this is an image of the bridge with its, array, its uh, raised lawn, which continues that main uh, central axis and then rows of trees planted to either side. And then the buses will be allowed to pass, um, uh, you know, either side of that of that green lawn. Um, the uh, plan for the Olympics, which will be in, in 2024, the, the bridge will be occupied by by the Olympics. They have the start and finish of some of the uh, the races there. They'll uh, erect uh, stands, so there'll be a um, a temporary. Uh, arrangement of the bridge um, before the Olympics and then after the Olympics we'll be able to go in and install the lawn and the trees and, and so on. And just uh, an image of the um, the cross section of the bridge. Again, wor working in the historic context has been really uh, challenging in Paris. You know, a lot of the old records for when the bridge was built in the mid 1800s are not available. They don't have the structural information. Um, so it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, a kind of digging around in archives to find um, find information that allow us to do the calculations to um, to build this um, you know build the lawn and build the trees. And then uh, another part uh, of the project is this um, extension of the um, Quai Branly. So we're taking one lane of traffic out so that we can uh, plant all along this edge. So people as they walk along will be completely framed by planting until you arrive at the Eiffel um, Tower site. And another major uh, plaza is this uh, Place Prony um, at the southern end, again with a raised um, a lawn panel and a pedestrianized area to either side where people can um, pass through that main axis and then enter into the Eiffel Tower uh, gardens. A lot of you might know if you've been to Paris, the, um, several years ago after um, the terrorist attacks, the uh, the gardens were enclosed with a glass uh, wall and a, um, a, a kind of uh, steel, corten steel uh, fence around it. And um, unfortunately, that um, enclosure needs to stay. But we've tried to camouflage it, if you will, with uh, with planting so that it's not so evident that, you know, that <clears throat> you were, um, you've got this uh, secure fence around it. So this is a view of the Quai Branly with, the, you know, it's uh, completely planted. There will be kiosks along it to for information, for food, for beverage, um, and so on. The gardens of uh, when when the gardens of the Eiffel Tower were originally built, and when the tower was originally built, the pillars came down and in, into this uh, picturesque garden. And today, that has been slowly eroded away, and, and now those pillars come down into a bunch of asphalt with a lot of uh, hot dog stands and you know. Um, uh, different buildings and and uh, queuing lines and you know it's a, it's a complete mess. So a lot of the uh, project was about how to organize the, uh, the the queuing lines, how to organize the people, how to um, again green the site. So the, the garden now comes in and encloses the um, the four pillars of the tower. There's a, a central square in the middle of this, which is a, a reflecting 
Um, you know, it'll, it'll be in black granite. So the, when it rains, you'll get this fantastic reflection of the underbelly of the of the Eiffel Tower with the you know reflection in, in the rain of the <clears throat> the lighting of the tower. Um, the art we're working closely with the uh, architects uh, Chartier Cobasson, and the the aim of the architecture is it's actually quite subservient to the landscape. So the 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 architecture is quite often um, hidden or enclosed um, by uh, by the landscape, um, and a lot of the work that we're doing, as I said, was about the you know the offer for um, visitors. Um, how we make their visit much more uh, pleasant, how they be easily find their way around. Um, we're raising the whole of this kind of central area so that at least two of the pillars are, um, you know, uh, completely at level. So anybody with any kind of disability can enter at grade. Um, and then there are lifts and ramps um, and stairs for the um, south and, and east pillar. And this is a view of uh, the underground office Offices. We're also extending um, the offices for the set, who's the the company that um, operate the Eiffel Tower, run and operate the tower. They needed more space. They didn't want to be very far from the tower. So we're digging down around the pillars and creating these two wings uh, that will be occupied by uh, by the set. So that's a, an overall view of uh, of the gardens. These. The, the gardens where the lakes are have recently been um, restored by the landscape architects uh, Vocht, who some of you may know. Um, and then we're, we will be restoring the uh, remainder of the gardens. Part of the project also involves creating two um, uh, bagageries, you know, a place where you can uh, check in your luggage so that you no longer have to take your backpack. And for security, it's also uh, better into um, into the Eiffel Tower or up into the lift. You can check things here, there are toilets um, and uh, a cafe and, and restaurant. And just a, a quick view of, of what that will look like, what the gardens will look like. Then um, we're also doing the northernmost um, uh, area of the Chon Mars. The southern area is going to be completely occupied by the Olympics. I think they have the beach volleyball or something like that. And there's also a temporary installation of the Grand Palais uh, just in front of the Ecole Militaire, which I think stays during the Olympics. So we can't really touch the whole southern end. Um, an important part of the project was also this the, the sort of re-greening. So we're trying to reduce the amount of hard surfaces, reduce the amount of pathways, and increase the amount of uh, planting uh, generally throughout the site. And then at the southern end in the um, future 2030 uh, vision, we hope to create a large uh, water feature plaza just in front of the, um, uh, just in front of the military uh, school. And I think, you know, the, the other important aspect just is, is about, and you know, the mayor of Paris is very, they signed a, the, you know, the uh, Paris Climate Accord they, she's really pushing a, a, a green agenda. We've had to work very hard to increase the amount of uh, green space by about 35 uh, percent, increase the biodiversity across the site with uh, more native uh, planting species, reinforcing all the green uh, corridors, uh, creating more permeable surfaces and sending all of the uh, rainwater into the planting beds rather than into the city uh, drainage uh, surface. So the city's quite, I think they're quite advanced really um, in, um, in imposing a lot of the uh, regulations. And again, and I just wanted to come back to this reference of um, painting and how one creates a sort of um, a contemporary picturesque landscape. And I think that, you know, in the brief, they describe the, this project as it's a bit like a, a, a pointless painting where you know, many, many dots come together into um, into a whole. And there are many different aspects to the project, which hopefully will come together in, in, in this uh, unified um, whole. And that was our sort of, um, you know, tagline, continuity, unity and uh, diversity. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> That's amazing. What a what a project. Yeah, it really is quite extraordinary. Um, so, 
Uh, are there questions or anybody want to chime in with anything? I'm going to look at the chat here. Lots and lots of clapping on hearts. Um, anybody have any questions? Ali? I would love to ask you if you've had any experience. I guess I got um, your career took you from America to England. And this project was one through an international call for submissions. Help. Yep. <laughs> um, and I guess in Canada, we don't have that process. We have the RFP process, which mm -hmm. calls for experience in portfolios before you're even allowed to submit a design. Mm -hmm. So I guess it could just, like, I want to learn more about the kind of North American and European approach to project competitions. Mm -hmm. And was going to ask, could you speak to anything about like the competition? Because this is an, an enormous, incredible project. Mm. Um, it was an interesting yeah. one. Yeah, I think I think most projects, um, you know, in Europe, there's an OJU process. So any publicly funded project over a certain value has to go out to competition. And normally, uh, and I would say it's true in the UK also, normally you there's a two step process where you get an RFP you know you say are you interested you send in your portfolio and um, uh, and then there you know you you get invited onto a, a short list to then enter into a competition in the case of the Eiffel Tower it was a particular form of competition it was called a competitive dialogue and they they actually paid four teams to work for a year uh, two landscape architects and two architects to work for an entire year with the city of Paris on the competition. And it was done in three stages. There's, you know, first phase where you, you presented sort of preliminary ideas. And then there was a second phase where you worked them up and we had to do a, you know, a cost plan and quite a bit of detailing. And then in the third phase was kind of the equivalent of a full on concept design that was fully costed and, um, you know, had an, had enough uh, detail in it that you know I, I would say it's, it's it would have been the equivalent of a of a concept design, but that was quite extraordinary. I mean, they paid you know four teams two hundred fifty thousand euros to work for for a year um, to make sure they got the right team for uh, for the project. I think most competitions are. Uh, uh, are not done in competitive dialogue. We do the competition. We we usually only do invited competitions. Um, they don't always. Uh, they aren't always paid. But we, you know, if if the if the competition is limited to five people, then you know you have a one in twenty chance of winning the competition because they're actually very uh, expensive to do. You know, you throw obviously everybody throws. There, you know, you throw everything at it, and you have a team of people working on something, and it, it actually, you know, when you when you work it out at the end of the day, they're expensive to do. So you need to kind of choose choose your competitions and choose them carefully. I don't know if that answered your question, but no, it did. Sorry, I'm just still trying to learn more, and I, I was part of the uh, Rio Monte Paris project in 2000, and I think it was 14 or 15, and that was a quite ex exciting project on behalf of Paris, but mm -hmm. no, I think that was 15 buildings along the perimeter mm -hmm. of which one and were paid for phase three and nothing came of that competition. So it's very exciting that uh, this has a very quick timeline, I guess, before yeah. and after the Olympic. But yeah, that's what the it's, a, it's a blessing. A, it's a blessing and a curse. <laughs> it sort of <laughs> definitely has a deadline. Um, and uh, but you know it's a sort of uh, it's a, it is it is quite stressful I must say when you have a deadline like that. So. And are a lot of the infrastructural kind of service related things being implemented before the Olympics, or that just because of the, I guess how much involvement in terms of city groups that will take it will. You mean to, for the Olympics itself or for this project? Yeah. I for mean, the, like some of the the infrastructural changes for the base of the, the Eiffel Tower for well, this yeah, project. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we are hoping that those will be done. I mean, the, the, the bits that I talked about are the, uh, the parts of the project that 
are meant to be completed before uh, before the Olympics. I think the problem that they're have I don't know if you've been reading in the news, but the problem they're having is because of COVID. A the um, the tower has been shut down, and also they're in the middle of painting the tower, the twentieth painting campaign for the tower, which is good. The tower has so many coats of paint on it that they're having to scrape it off. And as they're scraping it off, they found a lot of the paint has lead in it. And so it's now all been slowed down because the lead is, you know, um, uh, obviously getting on, you know, p p potentially can fall on visitors that, that are down below. And so they, because of COVID and because it's lead issue, they've closed the tower altogether, which means that it's going to slow down. We need, we need the painting campaign and the new lift in the North Tower to be finished before we can get on site. And, um, and so, uh, you know, things may be delayed and it, it just means we'll do less before the Olympics and more after the Olympics. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, oh, actually, there's something from Chris here, uh, Chris Hardy in the chat. Hi, Mary. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. I was wondering, in terms of competition work, what happens if none of the competitions go through? Are there, uh, uh, are there, was, was there something about making money from the work uh, that was done in the competition or in other projects, or do the, the work just go unused? So I think, yeah, yeah I think if. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think every, I mean, quite often have, I mean, we enter competitions all the time that don't go anywhere. Either we don't win them or, you know, I, you should, I'm gonna say, I, I'm gonna have to think of how many competitions we've won that have just stopped. Not that many, I think. But I think every, comp, I think you learn something from every competition and the people that have worked on it also learn from that experience. And um, and then, you know, you use that in in the next competition, everything from actually the conceptual thinking to also just how, you know, the, the kind of mechanics of getting a competition together and the boards and the graphics and the, you know, things like that, your your graphic style, your who your renderer is, how, you know, there's so much that goes into uh, the competition. But, yeah, I think you always learn. Uh, you, you always learn from every competition that you do. One thing I was I was reminded of in, when you're talking, Mary, just the I think the, the form of government that gives rise to uh, this originally and to this day is really interesting. There's not many places on Earth and I think it, that that have the capacity to to undertake these kinds of um, huge projects that affect the city in such a unifying way. Um, I, I don't know if you've been to Shenzhen, Mary, um, but uh, it strikes me as the modern day Paris in the sense, both because Shenzhen is, is, has become the kind of design epicenter in China of, of or the epicenter in China of design culture um, in a way that I think Paris was in the, in the late 19th century when the tower was built. Mm -hmm. um, and, I remember Rem Kula was talking about this and saying that, you know, one of the things that's great about working in, in France is that uh, they have a president um, as opposed to um, in Britain where everything is debated to the nth degree and and, and, uh, and and things don't get done quite as easily. And if the president wants something to happen, it will happen. And I think that also the the, um, the structure of the, and I don't know so much about the mayor of Paris, their their powers, but I think that there there is a kind of legacy of, of royalty of a different kind that that is different in, in other countries um like canada and the uk and and uh you know so i think of places like china and the usa and and france having some of that kind of centralized power that enables the um galvanization of of the public purse to make something truly extraordinary uh like this so um, yeah i think i think that's yet to be tested it's true uh -huh. i mean the mayor is very behind the project. She wants a planted bridge. Mm -hmm. um, but the city of Paris that the mayor runs is made up of many different departments. And right. guess what? Each one of those departments has got a different, you know, different request. So the historic monument people don't want a planted bridge. The environmental people want a planted bridge. The cyclists want this. The police want that. The taxis want this. The you know the people, highways people, they want that. 
And it's, you know, there is no consensus. Right. And at the end of the day, yeah, there has to be an ar you know, arbitration that goes back up to the mayor. Uh, but, you know, the, the getting there, and she may be able to, you know, uh, trump uh, everybody, I don't know. But it's also a national, you know, it's, also, it's, a, it's an iconic site. And for instance, the debate we're having at the moment with the bridge is, do we, do we have to go up up to the national level and get approval for, for the bridge or for the Champ de Mars and that kind of thing? Is it beyond the city, the mayor's capability to actually validate this project, stamp it, you know, say, yes, go ahead? Or do they have to go up to Macron's level and get the blessing from him? So we're still, you know, we're, we're waiting to see how it, um, how politically it sort of shakes down. Interesting. So I guess in that sense, it's not, you know, there was the Grand Projet uh, with things like the, um, the uh, I guess the was the, I forget whether the um, uh, Pompidou Centre was the Grand Projet, but there were, there was the, uh, the uh, conversion of a railway station um, on the left bank. Uh, the Quai d'Orsay, yeah. Mm -hmm. D'Orsay, that was a Grand yeah. Projet. And then there was the Citron factory, I think, the site was another uh, Grand Projet. And mm -hmm. I guess those, I mean, from a jurisdictional point of view, um, and I think that was what Coolhouse was talking about at the time, that um, those ones, there is a kind of clear line to the president uh, right from the get-go. But it sounds like in this case, uh, this is a, a city project. It's rather a city than project. A, That's right. Yeah. yeah, it's a ville de Paris, uh, and the mayor uh, Annie Hidalgo is the is the one that's driving the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. But yeah, interesting in in relation to that legacy of those of those kind of imperial projects. I mean, it's it it has it certainly has the, the like this image, for example, has the kind of guise of an imperial project, you know, and and it mm. does it does remind me of of the axis in Shenzhen, which were you know. Built over over a twenty year period, which is is, is the, the the unique place in the in earth, on earth, I think, as far as I've seen, other than Paris, actually, to have that the power of centralization of a of an axis that goes from a hill, um, you know, two kilometers north of the of the uh, central civics plaza all the way down through the business district to the port. Um, Versailles. And, yeah, that, that, um, I think Versailles yeah. is the model. <laughs> yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Try and copy. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, very interesting that uh, and to work yeah to have the opportunity to work in that context and then to see the machinations uh, of of what uh, how this all plays out is fascinating. Mm -hmm. So Mary, I want you to take me for a little walk walking tour around in 2024 when I come to when I come okay. for the Olympics. <laughs> Definitely, with pleasure. <laughs> So uh, another comment in the from Ethan. Uh, lovely work, Mary. Uh, as you're uh, as you're finding, uh, there is added stress to high profile projects like this. Are aspects of the design process changing for the projects of this magnitude? Aspects of the design process. No, uh, I don't think so. I mean, the challenge is always, you know, it is a public project and it has a limited budget. And so the challenge, I guess, you know, is achieving uh, achieving the vision within the budget and actually it's quite there's nothing particularly you know uh, difficult or of high value in in the project you know there's a lot of uh you know the, the pathways are concrete the you know some of the edging is 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 stone there's um, you know a lot of uh what do you call sub you know, it, they're very modest materials, but I think it's in the unification of the detail and the unification of the materials that will give the strength to the overall uh, the overall uh, project. So I think that will be our our uh, our challenge, really. Thanks so much for your response. Mm -hmm. Really uh, fantastic stuff. Thank you. Okay. Well, I guess unless unless there's anybody who's got a burning urgent question. Uh, we should probably take a break. Um, we're going to come back in at uh, three o'clock for Matt's talk about uh, construction documents. So we're moving from the sublime to the uh, to the uh, practical <laughs> control <laughs> to the practical. <laughs> yeah. So Matt, Matt teaches in the course uh, as well with me, and uh, he's talking about construction contracts and specifications. So some of the stuff you talked about, the specification of the of the concrete and the and the grass and and how that all. Works will be uh, 
it'll be manifest in a different way in, in Matt's talk. So, Mary, thanks so much. That was really, welcome, really John. great. Good to see you again. Yeah, great to see you. And okay. um, yeah, good luck, look everybody. To, yeah. Yep. Okay. Lots of claps. All right. Thanks, Mary. Okay. Right. Bye for now. See you.